following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. If you would, open up your Bibles or electronic device that has a Bible on it. We are in the book of Jonah. Jonah is what is called an Old Testament prophet. And that is a little book that is packed away uh, on the left-hand side of your Bibles. If you have problems finding it, um, just go ahead and use the table of contents. Uh, Again, my name is Jordan, and I'm just really glad that you're here this morning. Um, It has been really neat to see God work and move this summer, and we're excited about what God is going to do in the fall. Um, it's just a privilege and honor to, uh, to preach God's Word uh, week in and week out. We just, Bethany and I just love you guys so much, and it's, it's amazing to sing that song, uh, just knowing uh, where we've been and, and what we're going through and, and what we're going to go through too as well. So uh, Jonah chapter 2, if you're catching up and, and this is your first week, don't, don't stress, uh, last week's message is online. Go ahead and pick that up under the messages section uh, of, of uh, our website, and you can, you can see that and go back and um, pick up on some other messages too as well. And let's recap Jonah chapter 1, and then we're going to get into uh, Jonah chapter 2. You may know about this story. It's a, it's a common kid story that my Sunday school teacher growing up took some liberties with, uh, she's no longer with us in, in, in uh, physical bodily form, so I can't go to her and tell her she was wrong about some things, but that's okay, right? Like God's uh, righting all those wrongs in heaven with her right now, and that's, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, we know in, in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is famous for being what is called the running prophet, and uh, he ran from God. He, he ran from God's commands to preach. If you look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to this man. His name was Jonah. And he says, Arise and go to Nineveh, this great city that is full of pain and problems and distress, that is working against God. And I want you to preach against their evil that has come up before me. And Jonah does what so many of us do. He says, uh, I'm going to go the other direction. Verse 3, Jonah rose and, and fled away from uh, Nineveh and goes to Tarshish. And in chapter 1, we see that Jonah goes down, 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 down. He is uh, not only a running prophet, he is a downward prophet. And uh, Jonah continues to run away from the Lord. He's not perfect, neither are we. And we take comfort from these verses that show us that, well, we may be stubborn, right? And if you don't know if you're stubborn or not, the person next to you will help you with that this morning. Um, God never gives up on his children. Not once. He is constantly working. Romans 8.28 says, for the good of those who love him. And God answers prayers in three ways. He says yes to things. He says no to things. And he says, wait, never say that God does not answer your prayer request because he does. It just might not be in the way that you want. And here, Jonah, in the very end, in verse 17 of chapter 1, the Lord appoints a great fish, not a whale like Bethany said, who swallows up Jonah. And Jonah doesn't know that this fish was going to swallow him up. And Jonah's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And I don't think Jonah's hanging out. My Sunday school teacher said he just hung out in the belly of a big fish for three days. I'm like, no, like acid is eating away at Jonah's skin. A lot of people believe that when Jonah was vomited up on the land that uh, he was bleached white. He was just completely white, like he saw a ghost. (laughs) But uh, his skin was uh, essentially, uh, the acidic had gotten to it. And so here, Jonah realizes that he is in distress. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. What do we do when we're in distress? We pray to the Lord. And here, Jonah prays to the Lord. Now, I want to make a note. Bethany and I were talking about this yesterday. She's reading a very interesting book. 
And it made a comment about Jonah chapter 2 from a man named Eugene Peterson. I'm not a Eugene Peterson fan by any means. I think Eugene Peterson and I could have some good dialogue. And, and, and I think there's some, some things in regards to theology that we could converse about. But here it's really interesting because he does say something that's true. He says, there is something remarkable about the way that Jonah prays in Jonah chapter 2. He prays what is called a set prayer. It's not spontaneous, it's not original, and it's not something of his own self-expression. It is derivative. And that word derivative means he is stealing, or in church world we say we borrow permanently, like the pens in the pews, uh, (laughs) from another person. And no fewer than ten times does he quote the book of Psalms. Jonah has been to school to learn how to pray, not from his own personal endeavors. He has studied the Word of God, and he knows how to speak to God because he has spent time with God. And he prays as he has been taught. His school was the Psalms. Not a word in his prayer is original. Jonah gets every word, lock, stock, and barrel, out of his psalm book. We are mistaken when we assume that prayer is truer when it's more spontaneous. Jonah says, no. He is in his most vulnerable position. And what words does Jonah start to recall? It is the words of God. And so as Jonah starts to speak, he prays a learned prayer, meaning it's a form of prayer that is adequate to the complexity of his life and our life. So Jonah chapter Uh, 2 verse 1. Jonah prays as a prophet to the Lord his God from the belly of this fish that God appointed. Verse 17 of chapter 1. Pause and let's just open here for a second. This verse is not a cry to be delivered. This is a psalm of thanksgiving for God who does deliver. Look at verse 9. With the voice of thanksgiving, I'll sacrifice to you. This prayer is made while Jonah is in the fish's stomach. But remember, it is written all the way after these events have transpired. Jonah doesn't have a piece of paper and a pen and writing down all these words in the belly of a whale, right? Right? That's not how it worked. Again, I take issue with what happened on the felt boards in Sunday school, but I forgive as Jesus forgives. (laughs) Jonah's looking back after everything transpired, and he knows that God used, ready for this, the belly of a fish, a pain and a problem in his life to save him. And he worships God For what he provided, his mercies and delivering him from death. The same thing happened, Psalm chapter 30, verse 3. O Lord, the psalmist says, you brought up my soul from Sheol. We'll talk about in in a second what that means. You restore me to life from among those who go down to the pit. If you have a relationship with God through faith and trust in Christ, you can say those words. If not, you're still in the pit. It is good as believers to look back and see God's deliverance. David Wilkerson says it like this, how quickly we forget God's great deliverances in our lives. I think this is a hard case for a prayer journal. You need to see how God works in your life. How easily we take for granted the miracles that he performed in our past. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you use it for our good. So Jonah 2 connects to Jonah 1. Remember, Jonah's praying to the Lord his God from the belly of a fish because he ran because of disobedience. He's repenting here. He boarded a ship, storm came, all that other stuff. And here we see what I um, um, am, am kind of terming here, how we overcome pain and distress. There's three big questions that the world asks, and there's three big answers in the text. So Main idea, how we overcome pain and distress, answering three big questions. Verse 2, I called out to the Lord. Nobody else could hear Jonah, by the way. It's hard to hear somebody when they're in the ocean in the belly of a fish. (laughs) Out of my distress. And what do you do? He answered me. 
Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. The world's asking this question. I'm going to allow you to ask it because I ask it. Does God hear prayer in times of distress and pain? Good question. Jonah has a fear of death. There's no uh, uh, real answer if he's going to be saved in his mind. There's affliction here. There's anguish here. There's trouble here. But, but Jonah cries out of the belly of Sheol. Now, if you would, circle that word Sheol in your Bibles. It is the New Testament word Hades, which is a place of departed spirits or a grave. Some people believe that this is a place where people would go and sacrifice their unborn, or, or excuse me, their born children to foreign gods. It flowed with blood. It was a literal place. And some people feel that Jonah's physically dead here, but dead people can't talk or pray, among other things. So Jonah's not dead. <laughs> Jonah's saying, and I'm going to paraphrase this for you, Jonah's saying, this situation is bad. <laughs> If it escalates just one more inch, I'm dead. And you know what? He's right. <laughs> but God answers and he hears Jonah's cry for help. Now, several people in the Bible called out to God in times of distress and pain. For example, let's look at the psalmist. Psalm chapter 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Isn't it good that you can ask God questions? Our faith is not a faith that God is absent. God is present in pain and distress, and we are allowed to ask questions. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, can I question God? I said, questioning God and asking God questions are two totally different things. And you are allowed to ask God questions because people do it all the time in the text. Psalm chapter 13, verse 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long do you hide your face from me? Psalm chapter 44, verse 24. Why do you hide your face from me? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? God, are you around in pain and distress? And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's arrested, he asked God three times. My Father, if it is possible, would this cup be taken from me? I'm not having a good time right now. This isn't what I planned or envisioned. But I know that your plans are still to prosper. And so not as I will, but as you will. And God responds to every call for help, and we can trust him in his responses and cries for help. But it's always going to be in accordance with his good and perfect will. Keep that in mind. So I'm going to answer the question with two questions. Number one, does God hear the prayers of people who don't have a relationship with God through faith and trust in Christ? That's a good question. And a strict yes or no answer is difficult without qualifying an answer. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 tells us that God answers prayers based off whether they are asked in accordance to his will. So you better know the word of God in order to pray to the God of heaven and earth. If an unbeliever asks a prayer of God that is in accordance with his will, then nothing would prevent God from responding to such a prayer, but it has to be in accordance to his will. So my next question would be, uh, how does an unbeliever know the will of God? And I would say they don't unless they have a relationship with God through faith and trust in Christ. This is the gospel. So it all comes back to the gospel. When somebody asks me who doesn't know God through a relationship with faith in Christ, does God hear my prayers? My first answer is, do you have a relationship with God through faith and trust in Christ? Let's start there, and then we can talk about it. Okay, well, does God hear the prayers of a believer who is saturated in sin? That's a good question, right? Because the next response is, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but I still got some of these sins that hang around. They don't go away. Jonah's got some problems in his life, right, that aren't going away because Jonah's in the process of repentance. But here we wonder, does God hear the prayers of a believer in sin? And Scripture clearly teaches that God doesn't listen to every prayer. That's painful to hear. Just as a parent doesn't, quote, unquote, listen to every problem that their kid has. Scripture gives at least 15 reasons for God not listening to a prayer. Unconfessed, habitual sin, worshiping idols, lack of faith, the list goes on and on. 
But Jonah is repentant here, which causes God's ear to turn to him. Repentance is the one prayer that causes God to turn his ear towards us. And Jonah is repentant, and as believers who have received Jesus as Savior, we are encouraged that we can come boldly to God's throne of grace to find help in need. This is why we always start prayer requests with, God, I want to praise you for who you are, and then we immediately move into repentance of sin, and then ask in accordance to his will. And when we ask in accordance to his will, he hears us, and he gives us what we need, when we need it, and how we need it, because he's a good dad. Praise the Lord, we like Jonah can say here in verse 2, I called out to the Lord as a repentant sinner out of my distress, and he answered me. He lifted me from the grave, and he heard my voice. Can you say that today? Okay, so it continues. The second question. So does God put people in pain and distress? (laughs) Okay, I understand that, that God hears our prayers and how God hears our prayers. Is this God's fault? We all want to know that, right? Like the pain and distress you're in. Is this, did God do this? In verse 3, it says, For you cast me into the deep. I love that. Into the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me, and all your waves and your billows passed over me. Jump to verse 5. And the waters closed in over me to take my life, and the deep surrounded me, and weeds were wrapped around my head. Sounds like he's having a good time, right? (laughs) Does God put people in distress and pain? Did God put Jonah in this situation? Well, the first thing I would say is I'd blame the sailors, right? Like, they're the ones that threw Jonah into the sea. That's chapter 1, verse 15. But ultimately, God hurled Jonah into the deep. God is behind the sailors' actions, and Jonah knew it, that God cast him into the deep, and he alone was over the heart of the seas, the floods that surrounded him, all the waves that billowed, these large masses of water that passed over him. He could hear it on either side as those uh, waters passed, and he's thinking this is not a good situation, and these waters are closing in over him to take his life. This great fish continues to take um, these big gulps of water. They pass by his body. The deep surrounds him. The seaweeds come in. They're wrapped around his head. And Jonah, look at this. He says, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. The floods surround me. All your waves passed over me. Verse 5, the water's closed in over my head. All these things happen. And then he changes his tune in the rest of the chapter. And he says, I. It's almost like he takes full responsibility for his situation In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jonah's looking at God and he's saying, God provided distress and pain. John Maxwell says it like this, The greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility. That's when we grow up. We've been asking the question, what makes an adult? Uh, A couple of kids at sports camp said, when you pay taxes. (laughs) A couple of other kids said, when you live by yourself. A couple of other kids uh, had a few other answers that I can't repeat. But if we take total responsibility, that's when maturity starts to set in. Although God didn't bring about sin, he allowed it to transpire. Now, let me be clear with you this morning. All distress, all pain is a result of sin, and that was not part of God's original plan. Pain and distress are not from God, nor should he be blamed for it, as we are the ones at fault. Why is there cancer in the world? Why is there people who kill people in the world? Why is there pain? Why is there distress? Because it is called sin. Man chose his way over God's way, and we're suffering the consequences for it today. Sin did this. When we all suffer for it, it's either because of our own sin or somebody else's sin. And when pain and distress arise, we respond one of two ways. And before I give that to you, and you look at it and you go, but that's not fair. Uh, It is fair. That God hasn't wiped us from the earth in his judgment and that he lavishes upon us mercy and grace. And so when pain and distress come, I don't look at God and say, why did you put me in this? I ask two questions. Number one, is this because of my sin? 
And if it is because of my sin, then I have to repent like Jonah and turn from sin and seek the Lord and let him respond in his time and his ways. Take responsibility for your actions. And first part of taking responsibility for your actions is owning your own sin. Bethany and I have had some problems in our life. We've, we've gone through some things as a married couple, and we sit down all the time, and we go, who sinned, you or me? She's like, you did. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> She's like, hold my hand. We'll repent together. Question number two. If our pain, or response number two, excuse me, if our pain and suffering isn't from our sin but another sin, then we would do well to echo Richard Wormbrand's words, who was a missionary for the gospel of Jesus Christ who suffered at the hands of the Nazis in the Holocaust, who went through so many painful trials and tribulations, and he says, even the best of Christians are troubled by the questions, why does an almighty God send or at least allow suffering? He responds, when you are nagged by this thought, say to yourself, I must be still in elementary school. When I graduate, and what he's saying is when I die, the university of the Christian life, I'll understand that his ways were better and his doubts and my doubts, excuse me, will cease. You may look at the situation and say, I'm in the belly of a whale or a big fish. I'm in pain and distress, and maybe that pain and distress is God's provision. You just can't see it yet. Jonah starts to change his mindset a little bit, and the third question pops up. Look at verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet, I love this, circle that word yet, highlight it, underline it, do whatever you got to do to let it pop off the page. I shall look again, the God of second chances, the God of third chances, the God of 15 chances, I will look again upon your holy temple. Verse 6, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet, circle it, highlight it, let it pop off the page, is a beautiful word. You brought up my life from the pit. If you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, you don't get to say that, but you can. You can trust Christ today as Lord and Savior, and then you get to start saying these words, oh Lord, my God, personal relationship. When my life was fleeting away, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the book of Psalms. I remembered what his word says. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast life. Those who are saturated in secular society, you're not doing very well. You think you are, but you're not. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving and praise, I'm going to sacrifice to you. What I vowed, I will pay. Why? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? That's a beautiful thing. So the question on the table is, does God deliver people from pain and distress? Does God do that? Jonah knew he's driven away by God. Jonah knew that God put this situation in his life, but Jonah knew he was responsible for his disobedience. So he repents, and I love this. He like uh, comes and renews his faith like a teenager at church camp. And he expresses confidence in approaching God again. He says, I will look again towards your holy temple. If you're here today and you are far from the Lord, you think your relationship is severed or broken off of something you've done or something somebody else has done, you can say these words. I'm going to look again towards your holy temple. Now, holy temple may be Jerusalem. It could be heaven. Who knows? That's not important. What's important here is Jonah knows that it's only the Lord who can free him from this situation. It's going to happen two ways. It's either going to happen in death, which Paul said, that'd be great. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Kill me. Or deliverance, earthly deliverance. God alone, Jonah says, can bring up my life from the pit. And what's true for Jonah is true for us. Remember in Matthew 6, verse 13, it says, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And in that prayer, what does he pray? Or what does he teach them to pray? He says, you cannot resist the devil on your own strength. We trust in the Lord that he is able to save us from sinful waters that threaten our life. Popular pastor says it like this. He says, I love problems where I have no solution to them except to pray to the Lord. 
If the sea sank to the bottom of a mountain and the earth was about to entrap us permanently, it is the only the Lord, the living God, who is able to deliver from sin's penalty through faith in Christ. This is where I would encourage you highly to get a good cup of coffee when your problems and pain come and pull up a chair on the front porch and pray to the Lord that you would see his hand of deliverance come soon. Shut down your electronics, get rid of your computer, and do some front porch sitting and some hardcore praying. Watch what God does. It's there through daily reliance of the Holy Spirit. God, forgive me for the times I rely on these electronic devices and people in my life who need daily energy and to be recharged where you don't need to be recharged. You help us resist and overcome temptation. Look at Romans chapter 8. Paul says it so clearly in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Does God deliver people from pain and distress? Yes. But it's always in his time and his ways. Dad, when are we going to get there? Soon. The best way to be delivered from distress and pain, in James chapter 4, it says you resist the devil. Ready for this? Is to fully submit yourselves to the Lord's will, word, and ways, knowing he's in control. And what that does is that causes us to look in the mirror and say, God, where have I been disobedient? And where am I out of alignment to your word and your ways? Just as we need to ask over and over for daily bread for our physical needs, we also need daily deliverance for our spiritual needs. When our life is fainting away, like Jonah says, and we feel inches from death because of our sin, and the anxiety comes, and the panic attacks come, that's where we put everything away, and we say, Lord, you know. You are aware. You are the God of heaven and earth, and here am I in pain and distress, and I pray alone to you for deliverance. Help me breathe. You ever been there before? Like, God, would you just help me to breathe? And when we cling to him like that, it's not lifeless. It's not like a worldly idol. No one can deliver us like our God. He made the seas and the land. He's in control. The question on the table is, do you believe it? And sometimes it's, God, I believe it, but you got to help my unbelief, right? Deliverance from these perilous situations are a provision from a gracious God. And if it doesn't happen now, it will happen in eternity, and that's okay, There are some things in this world that are just not going to get worked out until we see Christ face to face, and that's okay. God delivers his people. He always has, and he always will, and he is working behind the scenes, especially in your situation. The question on the table is, are you obedient to him in the process? Are you running from the Lord? Does God want you to do something specific? We don't run... Away from problems, we run to them. And as we run to them, we lean on the Lord's wisdom and discernment. Let's pray Jonah 2 together. Heavenly Father, we pray to you, our Lord and our God and our Savior. Out of our distress, we repent of our wrongdoing the ways that we have done your word and your will a disservice, and we ask that you would answer us and that you would hear our voice. We're finding ourselves, Lord, in deep waters. We're finding our hearts discouraged. We're finding situations in this world are like floods that surround us. And so, God, as individual believers as well as a congregation of saints, we look again upon your holy temple. When these waters close in over us to take our lives and the deep surrounds us, we believe, God, we believe that you are able to bring us up and give us new life from the pit. You are here this morning. You don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. It's so simple. How difficult do you want God to make it? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, for whoever, that's you and me, would believe 
put their faith and their trust. He will call you a child. He will call you his child. Repent of your sin and trust Christ this morning as Savior. The Bible says that this Savior is not a condemnation. He is a salvation. He works to restore our souls. And Lord, for those of us who have made this decision when our life was fainting away, we remember you. We remember our prayers to you. And God, forgive us when we look at vain idols and we try to get love in places that are not of you. Help us to be realigned this morning and know that salvation belongs to you and to you alone. And God, we would ask for deliverance. We would ask, God, that you would deliver us from our pain and distress, but if not, open our eyes to have awareness that it might just be your provision. Give us the ability to worship you regardless of the season that we find ourselves in life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As uh, we're getting ready to close, I missed verse 10, but I love it, and it sets us up to worship. It says, the Lord spoke to the fish. In other words, God speaks to the problem. And he vomited Jonah out up upon the dry land. And it is there that Jonah praises the Lord even more as we praise him today. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.